If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. I'm glad to tell you we've got somebody here from Tel Aviv, an Israeli, but also a South African. And he was at Savannah and he was there as a young man and he's got a fantastic story to tell us and he's writing a book about his experiences. And we are glad to have him here with us. Name is uh, Lauri Sohat. Now he told me how to say his name, so I have to give him credit here. Lauri, the more welcome. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Let us start at the beginning. You grew up in South Africa. You were Jewish, and I suppose you got called up to the army to do your national service. Yeah, 1975, Walters Bay. Okay, so I'll, I'll just, uh, I'm going to take you guys on, on, on a journey. Um, there's no way that I believe I said to Chris within an hour that I'm going to be able to manage to tell this long story because it is long. So we may split it into two or three sections. Um, and then as, a, as an introduction, what we're going to, what I'm going to do is I, I, I want to just read to you um, the first kind of introduction to, to uh, my book, uh, the first from the first chapter, these are the notes I've made, and and that will just kind of kick off into into the story of of how I got there, what happened, uh, etc. So here goes. I called it the Rundu Crossing, uh, and this is specifically once again uh, um, not only meant for those who were in uh, Savannah or in or on the border of Southwest Africa in '75 or even afterwards. Um, so you would know where Rundu was, and if, if you weren't around and you an outsider, you can just look up uh, Rundu, R-U-N-D-U, uh, in Southwest Africa. Today it's called Namibia, and, and, and that's my starting point. Or should I say that's my ending point, because that's where I ended with two months of being up uh, in Angola in, in late 1975. So there I was. I'm just going to read this to you. It's just not that long. And then I'm going to start telling my story. So there I was sitting in our Toyota Land Cruiser with no roof and no windscreen and to accommodate and, and that was to accommodate the sh machine gun that was affixed to the vehicle you'll see a picture of that later and with my finger on the trigger and sitting alongside a heavy bearded major frank best beer who had interchanged driving duties with me every few hours when in the distance i know noted a, a wire a gate had we reached the end of this long journey was this the gate that opened our entrance back into Southwest Africa and our exit after four months out uh, inside Angola? The date was December the 13th, 1975. We approached it slowly so as not to frighten off any South African troops manning the border post. The last thing we needed was for them to open fire on us, okay? And they would have done it quite easily because we weren't recognizable as South Africans anymore not as South African army troops for sure. For one, we weren't wearing the South African browns, the uniforms or the boots. We were not driving our standard South African army uh, vehicles. We were in a land cruiser, but uh, rather we were an assortment of trucks, land cruisers and jeeps in an array of different colors. We had long hair, we were unshaven, most were bearded, I, my beard doesn't grow too well. And we were coming out of nowhere uh, no notification that we were arriving, totally unannounced. There were only six vehicles left in our little convoy after we had dropped off the remaining black FNLA troops uh, along, the, along the journey in different towns and villages along the way. We had been traveling due south almost nonstop for three days from Sela, which is up in, in, in uh, mid-Angola. And, um, and when it got dark, we we had to stop and, and camp out because we couldn't risk uh, bumping into the Swalpo uh, terrorist organization troops that you know were inundated around all that bushy territory uh, inside the south of Angola. Uh, we were now about to cross back into Southwest Africa and head into the nearby Rundu base, which is one of the largest or central bases of the SADF in South Africa. Um, we had been in Rokana in the West when we first started out. Um, Runda was near more in, in the East close to the uh, Caprivi Strip, I would say. And Runda had been serving as the HQ of Operation Savannah 
throughout um, the couple of months that, you know, since it had started back in, in October. We had 400 meters to go. And so many thoughts raced through my head. Our 1,500 kilometer journey had now come to an end at last. I'd been in Angola for four months, two of which had been at the Rokana Customs Post near the waterfall, where uh, we had seen thousands of poor Angolan refugees desperately escaping uh, Angola, the murder, the rape, the savagery that had been taking place there between the, the three uh, you know, fighting uh, organizations of MPLA, FNLA, and UNITA. We'll get to that later as well. And um, then uh, also we had two months in actual Operation Savannah, which uh, started in October, where I had been part of Battle Group Zulu, and we had routed the MPLA time after time, capturing almost half of Angola within three weeks and driving up uh, in a journey of over 2,500 kilometers. The journey down was 1,500 because it was a straight line. I hadn't been home to my family in all this time, and I'm talking about nine months, and I had no idea if they had, if they had any idea about my whereabouts or even if I was alive. And that's another story. I was missing, presumed dead. That's an, another story later on, and I've got proof to, to show you guys. I hadn't slept in a proper bed, had a hot shower, a haircut, or shaved in four months. I had been cut off from the world completely. I hadn't seen any of my own compatriots from two side. Here's my badge, guys, that's my two side badge. Um, I hadn't seen them originally from, from the days of Walfus Bay. Was, I, I had left them behind in Fort Rosades after we, uh, the two side guys had attacked Fort Rosades, uh, which was the first time, time that we had actually entered deep into Angola to attack a town. And that had been seven weeks ago. I had no idea that I had been in Operation Savannah because we didn't know the name was Savannah at the time, nor of the casualties incurred or the fact that the world pressure had now turned against South Africans' involvement and that would eventually lead to a total, a total pullout of our forces within the next three months. I think it was by about March 2000, uh, 1976. I had no idea that the SADF even had other battle groups fighting the MPLA on other fronts such as X-Ray, Orange, Beaver. These were the names of different battle groups that were formed subsequent to Zulu in different areas of Angola. What I did know was that we had survived and would now live to tell our stories, or would we? I mean, 40 years passed and, and nobody said a word. Word had got out back to us up north that the military police were searching every troop who arrived back on the border. And everybody who was up in Angola, he knows that very well. And uh, every troop were arrived back on the border and removed all signs of the operation. Clothing, weapons, and other mementos were taken away from the people. And boy, did I have a stash. I had an Uzi, which as a Jewish guy, that was very proud of, you know, this is my like token gun. I had an AK-47, I had a Portuguese G3. Many of you guys who were up there also collected similar weapons. And I had a kit bag full of camouflage clothing, hunting knives, and more. Uh, and this was small fry compared to the two truckloads uh, of arms and booty accumulated by the wreckies who I, I, I was with in this little team, driving uh, with us in the two trucks behind me. The recce commander, the famous and feared and outstanding uh, Special Forces leader, uh, Colonel Jan Breitenbach, was driving in a land cruiser just behind us. Okay, there's a picture of, of us as well that, uh, that I'm going to ask uh, First to, to post for you guys. And so we slowed down to a stop as the two troops approached us just before the gate, looking at the scruffy ragtail uh, group of people and asking who the hell we are. And we looked a little bit dangerous, as you imagine. Okay. We were as close as being mistaken for mercenaries. We had no hint of South African identities. Uh, our, we had no ID as well. So we were the very last remnants of the original Zulu task force that had entered Angola in early October, over two months earlier. We had split up along the way, but, and we had been replaced slowly but surely uh, over time. The armored car guys were replaced, the, the, the mortar guys were replaced, et cetera, et cetera. And even the black troops of the FNLA had also now just been replaced. Most of us had flown back on the Frosties, the other uh, SA, 
you know, the South African Air Force C-130 transport planes, okay? And so very few, in fact, had actually driven their vehicles all the way out of Angola. Most of them were flown out at the time. The fresh replacement troops were flying in by the hundreds into Sela, and there was no more pretense as to who they were. Uh, over the past week or so, we had noticed that they all wore their regular South African brown uniforms now. They, wore their, they had their regular R1 rifles as well. Um, and, and so there was no pretense anymore. That we, they weren't being given out those green uniforms. On the left, in the piece was this high guard post uh, made up of wooden logs and covered with foliage. At, at first, we didn't see it until all of a sudden, somebody shouted out, Shochat, what the fuck do you hear? <laughs> I looked up into, the, into this thing. I didn't know who was shouting at me. I had no idea. And um, I couldn't recognize him. I assumed that he may be somebody from uh, our Tusai, but I knew that Tusai weren't out in Rundu. So I only uh, assumed that this guy was some ex uh, guy, uh, Worcesterite. Uh, I grew up in Worcester. And about 10 of us actually got our call-up papers to go to Tusai in, in uh, uh, Walters Bay. So I gave the guy a wave. I had no idea. I never saw him. And to this day, I don't know who he was. But he recognized me somehow. Um, so with that introduction and identification of uh, the most of the points, uh, but surely not only that, the true troopies then opened the gates and let us through. And even though the bush is covering territory, didn't change a bit on the other side of the fence, there was an amazing sigh of relief. That pounding in my heart in the knowledge that at any turn of the road, one could get attacked and which had been with me for the last two months, every single day. You're up in Angola, you've got no idea. Are you gonna survive another day? Will you be blown up, attacked? Uh, will rockets fire upon you? You have no idea. And this all of a sudden was like behind me. And we drove down the, the dust road a few kilometers to the base. I wondered to myself, how the hell had I gotten into this escapade, okay? This top secret of wars. Somehow I found myself time after time at key junctions, junctions in, in the timeline of events leading up to and within Operation Savannah, I somehow was there. And I'm about to tell you guys, you know, what happened. I didn't kill anybody at least not directly, um, but I had seen much death around me, unfortunately. And for an 80, 19 year old who had uh, never gone overseas and not seen a TV set um, and so many other things in those days, you know, for people who didn't grow up in those days, it's difficult to conceptualize, but that's what we were. Most of us, I, I think had never even been in a plane before. I'd gone once to go visit an aunt in Johannesburg, that's it. And all of a sudden, you're taken away from home, and not just for a week or two, for months at end, and, and you're not in touch with, and you don't see not family or friends. That, that's, that, that's a big challenge. I had on many occasions been fearful, okay? Uh, but not close to the fear that I had witnessed in others, from refugees to captured MPLA troops, as well as innocent civilians caught up in the crossfire. I had always... I had somehow found myself always on the wanted list, possibly as I was a signaler and I was also a driver. So every now and again, somebody would nab me and say, shock at you coming along for the next part of the journey. And I got dragged into this time after time after time uh, without the opportunity of saying, no, I've had enough, I will go home. So I was volunteered by certain senior officers and I found myself going along on this adventure. And for me, really, as a young guy of 19, it was an adventure. It was an exciting adventure. Uh, you didn't feel fear the way maybe today at this age we, we would feel. But at that age, you know, just give it to me. Okay. In, in, and, and I'd been one of the very first South African troops to actually hear about the emergency call up in late July 1975 of thousands of troops to the Angolan border. I was at the Rukano airport when a Learjet whisked off our commanding officer to give him the very first instructions on moving into Angola. This was all hush hush and very shoo shoo. I was the signaler who trained the ELP uh, uh, unit. And then you ask who the hell is the ELP? ELP, you can look it up. It was a group of about 50 mercenaries 
uh, from Mozambique, Portugal, Angola, that had settled in, Chita in a place called, a little dusty village called Chitado. And, and they were helping the, the South African troops. And because they were all Portuguese speaking, they had no, uh, no idea how to use a radio. So I was the guy not only who trained them in the use of radio, but afterward, they were so useless at it that I ended up being their radio man. So I was like, I spent quite a bit of time with these guys as well, and we became good friends. And this was all the way up to Sada Bandera. Thereafter, um, I also served um, in the Zulu HQ as a signaler, driver, batman. I made the guy breakfast, lunch, and supper or the second in command, uh, Commandant uh, Kotsa was his name. And so being in the HQ of Zulu, I knew all the time where I was, where we were, I knew what was going on. And, and, and therefore, uh, today I'm able to at least share that story with you. Um, and, and I know my facts, I knew the dates, I knew what was going on, and I knew what troops were around. Um, thereafter, I actually was in a similar position as driver, um, a signaler and etc. for Major Frank Bestbeer, who I understand unfortunately passed away just about three, four months ago. And he was the guy who actually trained uh, the FNLA troops in southern Angola just prior to the Operation Saveda. And so with him, I was, uh, I was with him after uh, the split up of Zulu um, at Novo Redondo. And from Novo Redondo, half of the Zulu force went drove to Sela to join uh, the other guys in Fox Bat and Orange. So I was with him as well, and we played quite a role prior to um, Bridge 14. So I was actively and closely involved with the Special Forces units, better named as the Rekis at the time, uh, and specifically with the bombing of the MPLA forces prior to Bridge 14. And I'll tell you that story as well later, plenty of stories to tell. Most of these activities were carried out just behind the lines. So in fact, I didn't actually, um, I wasn't actually right in the front line. I was just always just a few kilometers back. So I knew what was going on, but I wasn't, I wasn't hiding in, in, in you know, in, in dugouts uh, to, um, you know, and under bombardment. And therefore, in a way, as opposed to quite a few of my other mates on, in, in the different Angola groups, I never actually suffered with, for, with any P, you know, PTSD or any type of, of uh, you know, post, post uh, training uh, um, or post army fatigue or, or, or stress and that type of thing. I kind of, I believe, okay, that I came out okay. So I'd been through much, I, su I survived it all. I was now tired and battle weary and all I wanted to do was go home. And these were my thoughts as, uh, as we entered the Rundu base, went through the gates, not one MP, they just looked at us and they opened the gate. They didn't search us, they didn't take anything away from us probably are the only troops that that happened to. And, and that was over 40 years ago. I think it's 47 years today uh, from 1975. And, and that's my story. So let me, let's start at the very beginning. Okay. So uh, as I said, I grew up in Worcester, uh, uh, in, did the matric in 1974. And, and late in 1974, we received our call-up papers, about 10 guys in, in Worcester, um, received a call up to go to uh, Walfus Bay, which was one of, I think, seven or eight infantry uh, bases for basic training. And Walfus Bay was the furthest. It was the only base uh, in Southwest Africa at the time. And, and because it was so far away, we were the first guys to actually go into the army. Everybody else laughed at us because, um, you know, we had to go on the Jan January the 3rd and they were only gonna go on the 6th or the 7th. So uh, we took a three day and three nights journey to Walfus Bay. Uh, and from, you know, you, you get out the train and from then for the next three months, you, you don't walk, you, you run, you get shouted at, you hardly sleep, but you know, we were all ready for it. We, we were tough enough. Um, the, the, I think the, the, um, the big challenge was just being totally away from home, not in touch. We had a thousand troops at, at the base with two telephone lines. Once a week, you went to make a five minute phone call and that's it. And you had to, you had to actually survive and, and manage, uh, let's say, psychologically uh, on your own. Because physically, we could handle all the running, we could handle the sand dunes, that wasn't a problem. Anyhow, so basic training came to an end. I actually went back with a, just a couple of guys uh, on our seven-day uh, leave, um, seven-day pass, I think we called it, 
because the Jewish guys had uh, Pesach, the Passover. So the rest of the guys stayed in the base and they actually, all the whole base went on seven days leave, actually only in July. Now we knew, we knew already at the outset that at some stage, uh, two Sai is going up to the border. A lot of uh, shit had been happening on the border. There had been a, a mainly a police presence, not an army presence on the border. Uh, most of what was happening was on the eastern side of, uh, of the northeastern side of Southwest Africa, along the Caprivi Strip and Rundu, where there were these um, infiltrators, terrorists from uh, Swapo coming across the border. And it wasn't like we have here in Israel or, or elsewhere that you have two or three or five. They were coming across in dozens, maybe even hundreds at a time, crossing the border and, and, and killing and, and kidnapping people and taking them back into Angola to their camps and training them. And South Africa needed uh, uh, additional forces there. The, the border was hundreds and hundreds of kilometers long. And, and, and that was the original plan. That plan that though changed. And, and why it changed, we were, all happened um, in not only Angola, but in Portugal. Because in Portugal, Portugal had been under a dictatorship for many years. And there had been a coup, uh, a military coup, and then the civilians took over. There was a new government, a socialist government in place. And that was, that was back in 1974. And um, the Portuguese for many years had been fighting this battle against these three uh, uh, underground uh, black movements uh, split up, uh, across tribal lines in Angola. Uh, the MPLA, which was the communist-based uh, uh, um, organization, and then there, was, uh, there were two uh, Western-backed uh, organizations, the one, the FNLA, and, and then UNITA down in the South. So each of them looked to, one to America, one to China, other one to Russia uh, for military and other and political support. And they had been killing and, and, and shooting at uh, Portuguese troops, trying to upset them as possible to say, get out, we want independence. And after many years and this new Portuguese government came into power, they said, we've had enough. So in fact, in January 1975, 1975 they, signed, uh, in, uh, they signed something called the Alvor Agreements, where, um, where all three of these organizations came together with the Portuguese government. They said, we're gonna have peace. Uh, we will have independence on the 11th of November and everything would be hunky-dory. That agreement didn't last, I think, a week. And the fighting not only continued, it got worse and worse. And in about July, 1975, um, troops actually, funny enough, not of the MPLA, but of, of UNITA and FLA down in the South, went and attacked um, key installations across, you know, uh, near Ruokana and uh, Kolek, which was where the hydroelectricity project was. And that was a big uh, interest for South Africa because they produced a lot of the, the electricity uh, in Southwest Africa. And South, Af and South African, the South African government couldn't stand by and watch this happen. Not only that, so that was one specific thing that kind of drove South Africa to going in and sending us up uh, to the border. The other one, of course, was that uh, there was a growing uh, presence of the MPLA in Angola taking over all the key cities. So, so the South African government came to the understanding that if they sit around any longer, before they know it, they're going to have this big pro-Russian communist uh, uh, party uh, running a country on their border. Not only running the country, but very actively supporting SWAPO. So they're not going to get rid of SWAPO if the MPLA take over. So um, what, what, what took place was South Africa came to a decision after these troops had now entered Kolek and, and, and uh, were now spread across uh, the border and interrupting this whole project, was, which was still actually, it hadn't gone live yet, it was still in, in the works. Uh, in the meantime, just going back to, to Walfus Bay, um, when I came back from seven days, myself and, and five others, they took six of us and we became battalion signals which means that we were no longer in the companies. We weren't doing all the pole PT and all that other Afka um, that other troops were going through. We were running uh, all the radio networks and, and radios and, and the telecommunications, even the telephone itself with this big black switchboard, we were running it at the base. 
And we were also going out to Roycock base where there was a artillery and, 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 uh, and uh, armored car uh, unit out there as well, which is just like 20 kilometers outside of, um, outside of Walfus Bay. And so it, it was kind of peaceful and hunky dory. We were just doing a job. Uh, in July, uh, seven, 800 of the troops went off on their seven day pass all back into South Africa. And then all of a sudden, uh, to say, to put it lightly, mildly, the shit hit the fan. And, and uh, in our radio ops room, we had a, a um, we had a permanent force guy there as well, who, he who was a cryptographer. So we had two uh, telex machines that these telexes were coming and all of a sudden we were getting these telexes that were all um, uh, encrypted. No words, just a whole babble of letters and he would pull it out the machine, go into his room lock and lock it up and then go through and read what and decipher these messages that were coming from Pretoria. And I was there, we were there, we were watching. And I'd say to, in a way that this was the start of Operation Savannah. July 1975, Pretoria came to a decision that um, troops have to be sent up to the border to uh, Rukwana and Kolek, which was an area where we didn't have any troops. It was on the Western side of, of, the, of uh, Angola, of Southern Angola. And, and we needed to get forces there as soon as possible. So the closest forces that we had was the infantry unit at Walfus Bay. But at the same time, everybody is spread out all over South Africa. So myself and, and some of the HQ uh, uh, signalers and that uh, were in touch with Pretoria almost around the clock. And in Pretoria, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't emails. There weren't cell phones in those days. So I actually don't know how they got hold of everybody, but somehow they did. They organized trains. And all these hundreds of troops were pulled out of their seven day pass and came back to Walfus Bay from Durban, Joburg, you name it, all over the country. So they arrived back in, in early August. And around about the 10th of August, um, we were flown up. I think at first, just two companies were flown up. I flew up with the guys. It was HQ Company and Bravo Company, where I actually did my basics. And we were flown up in C 130s. First time we had been in a C 130, it was frightening. Uh, and we arrived at this airfield where there was nothing around. We knew we were on the border and we were new. Um, we were in a place called Ruakana. Um, some parabats had actually taken over and kicked out the, the uh, UNITA troops uh, who had been in one or two of the border posts near Kalek and, and Ruakana. There was a customs uh, or police uh, like building on the border where people used to cross. So the parabats actually did the dirty work a, a week or so before us. And once we arrived, we spread ourselves out. Bravo company went to collect and they also maintained the, 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 um, the airports. They protected the airport. Uh, HQ company also spread itself out. And, and I joined some of those guys at this uh, uh, customs post, at this border post. We also received uh, one or two armored cars there as well. The armored cars obviously weren't flown up. Uh, they were they were driven up. So the day we flied out, the guys from the armored cars from out at Roycock, uh, they drove up. It took them, I think, uh, two days, then off. And, and when they arrived at the airport, at, uh, you wouldn't call it an airport, it's an airfield with like a little building. Uh, when they arrived there, it was late afternoon, and I was actually at, at, at uh, the base there, uh, just you know, getting batteries for the radio. And all of a sudden, we heard... Uh, uh, do, 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 a machine gun went off. And, and that was like kind of frightening. What the hell, a machine gun? I mean, you know, are we being attacked or whatever? And being in the radio room within minutes, we knew what was going on. Um, the armored cars had actually lined up in two, two rows like this, and they were cleaning their vehicles and their guns. And the one guy, uh, I'm not going to mention names now, because it's been my book, and it's a guy called Sam van der Berg. And it was in his armored car that the one guy actually got shot and killed. And, and the one, and because they were lined up one behind the other, when the, when the gun went off, it actually shot at and injured and killed one of the other, the other guys. And all of a sudden, the, let's say the danger of, of um, this aspect of danger that before you may not have felt it, it hit you. A guy just got killed. We didn't know he got killed at the time. Um, 
but they had a light plane to fly out to, I think, to, um, I don't know if it was to the, the nearest hospital, or if it was in Rundu or Grootfontein, but it was getting dark and it was an airfield. There were no lights. So what the armored guys did is they, they lined up along the runway, they lit up their headlights to make it uh, easy for the plane to actually take off. So this is just one little anecdote that uh, Sam himself has written about and, and they flew the two injured guys out. And later on, we heard that the one had actually unfortunately passed away. So we had just arrived there. We hadn't even started our operational activities. And one of our guys had already been killed by our own forces, unfortunately. OK, so, so after that had happened, we then uh, took over this customs base. And we, we then spent two of the most boring, boring uh, months in, in my life because all we did was um, we did patrols around the little village. We protected the uh, South African and Portuguese engineers who were working on, on the project. We used to go every now and again and, and visit the waterfall and swim underneath it. We'd go to Chicago to join these ELP guys, these uh, mercenaries, these Portuguese mercenaries, who were acting as a buffer between us and all these convoys of hundreds of, um, of poor uh, uh, Angolans who were now leaving Angola. They couldn't live there any longer. And, and actually, you know, I'm talking now at the time that we're witnessing every day the refugee problem in the Ukraine. And they're talking about two and a half million, and they're talking about tens of thousands of Russian troops. You know, when we went into Angola, we were, we were maybe 150 South African troops. That's all we were. We took over half of the country with 150 troops. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And, and, and the other point with regard to the refugees is that unknown to, to most people in the world today, but half a million, almost half a million Angolans, most of them the white original settlers, who had been there not for 10 years or 20 years. They'd been there for hundreds of years, from the, 90, from the 1600s, 1700s. They had to pack up with almost whatever they could put in their cars and leave in the hope that they wouldn't be robbed, raped, or murdered all, along the way. And the Portuguese uh, flew them out in planes. The South Africans accepted a lot of them. Many of them died along the way. And we were there at the Rokana base uh, as we watched them going through. We didn't search them. We, we, we gave them food, water, whatever we could do to help them as they came out. And these ELP guys um, were sitting out in Chitado where they had to drive past Chitado. And they were looking out for P uh, MPLA, you know, insurgents who, who maybe uh, try to filter in with the crowds trying to leave. And they caught some and you didn't want to be on the wrong side of these guys because they, they, you know, they had their own rules, they had their own laws. Nobody, there was no police force, there was nobody telling them what to do. And it's known that, you know, some people just disappeared out into the bush uh, with no questions asked. And, and I don't really want to go into that. Anyhow, one day in Early October 1975, my Sergeant Major comes to me and he says, um, Sergeant Major Berger, who was the Sergeant Major of, of, of uh, uh, HQ Company, and he picks one or two guys and he says, Shokot, you were signaling her, right? I said, yeah. He says, come with me. So after two months of literally three hours on the radio with your headphones and then six hours off, three hours on 24 hours a day and night, all of a sudden, you've got an opportunity to do something different. That's it. Go for it. And, and I think that's what actually um, kicked off for a lot of the troops who were um, offered the opportunity to do something different. It didn't matter to them. They didn't know maybe how dangerous it would be in the end, but they went along for the ride. So he said to me, bring your sleeping bag. He didn't say bring a change of clothing. He didn't bring, bring your towel, bring your whatever. I went with a, literally with a toothbrush and a and, and a sleeping bag, and, and what I, I was wearing, unknown. I, I had no idea where I was going. We drove out to a, and this is with some of the other troops as well, we drove out near Kalek to a, a, a tree-lined opening. So from the outside, you couldn't see what was going on. And all of a sudden, we saw over there these armored cars, our armored cars from two sides, which previously had been yellow. You know, the color of the, um, uh, of the sand in, in Walfers Bay, they'd been painted with green, green stripes and camouflage. 
and there were words on it written, UNITA, VIVA FNLA, and that type of thing. And we were stripped, not stripped, we were given these green uniforms, we were given these tackies, we were told to strip off any time, our dog tags were taken off. Um, and um, basically all our vehicles, whatever vehicles we had, they had the number plates taken off. We, we were told to remove any type of identification that um, showed us as South Africans. That evening, um, our um, commandant from Tusai, um, Boy de Toy, gave us an outlining of what was going to happen in the sand. He drew one or two pictures and said, we can, we're going to attack, attack this town, a town called Rosades, which is, I don't know, 100 kilometers inside Angola. He didn't say why, but probably he didn't know why, okay? Which is uh, more often the case in this whole operation, Savannah, that was so secret that nobody really knew what the next step was. Nobody knew what the ultimate plan was. They were, say, they say, they were told, do this, do that, they did it. So we, we got ourselves ready for this uh, attack. And me just being a signaler, I was going along for the ride. I was just gonna sit at the back of the vehicle and, being, and be the signaler for my Sergeant Major. And we waited overnight and the next day off we went, we started this journey up the 100 kilometer journey. We stopped at a little, it's not even a village, a little outpost along the road. There were just a few houses, a place called Nolila. We were told to stop. And I was now the signaler for the commandant as well. And for three days, we, we, we stayed there. Three very frustrating days, not knowing why, why we, why we had to halt. What happened? They're going to find out that we're on the way. Somebody's going to tell them. And apparently, and this was the story, that for two months now, South Africa had been training troops, um, Bushman troops, uh, as well as uh, local tribesmen in the south of the country, who, who ultimately became FNLA uh, troops, in, in two or three different bases. They literally took them out of the bush and, and, and trained them quickly in two months' time uh, many of them didn't even have shoes on their feet. In, they trained them in the use of, of guns, uh, mortars, uh, and, and other light weaponry. And uh, they were trained mainly by um, our own Rekis, uh, who had gone to, to join them. And they were the initial Zulu force. They put them together, and they said, they're going to attack a town called Pereira de Esh. And this would be the start of the Zulu, uh, uh, you know, attack into and up to central uh, Angola. Whether the, at the outset, uh, and remember we're talking about early October, whether at the outset the South African government had put specific uh, goals as to what they wanted to achieve and by when, that wasn't uh, clear to us. We actually didn't know about this uh, excuse me, this independence notification that by the 11th of, of November, Angola was going to give, be given independence by the Portuguese and depending whoever ran uh, or had the most um, uh, power in Luanda and elsewhere in Angola were, were basically going to be given the keys to running the country. None of us knew that. Remember, we didn't have TV at the time. We didn't have newspapers. We had no idea. We were very insular in South Africa. We were just going along to that town. That's what we knew. Uh, in Pereira de Esh, this, this uh, Zulu force, which we didn't know anything about, by the way, even uh, 40 years later, we discovered in writings by, uh, you know, by uh, uh, the various people who've written, like um, uh, um, you name it, the commandant, the colonel of the Zulu force, they didn't know about us and we didn't know about them. Okay. So, we got stuck in Nolila because they, they got caught in Pereira de Esh. Uh, apparently there was a much stronger MPLA force than they, 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 they thought there would be. They got delayed there, we got delayed. And eventually I, I as a signal that the commandant was coming to me every hour, have you heard anything, have you heard anything? And eventually the code word was given that we can now continue. And we all jumped on the vehicles. We had this convoy of about three kilometers long and off we rode at high speed, and I was in, um, in a Unimog, actually. I was sitting at the back of the Unimog. My sergeant major was driving, and there was another guy next to him. And we were driving into battle. 
And he probably realized that why, why should he be driving and he can't even shoot, you know, because he's driving the vehicle. And he shouted to me, Shachat, take over from me. Now, I learned to drive a Unimog uh, back in, in the desert. And so while we're driving at about 60 or 80 kilometers per hour, I had to jump over the back, sit in, and he moved to the side because we couldn't stop. There was no stopping. We were about to go into battle. And, and I continued driving Unimog until we drove into uh, this town of Rosades. Um, before we know, we knew it, we had stopped the guys uh, from two side with the, uh, with the 81 millimeter mortars, quickly put out their mortars behind and started shooting at the sport on the hill. Um, our armored guys as well uh, from the armored squadron were shooting the hell out of the fort as well. And there was this whole battle going on and I'm lying there with a few of the other infantry troops waiting and then they eventually said attack and we ran with our guns, but there was nobody to shoot at. The, the one or two guys that were left at the base um, were obviously killed. The MPLA had, you know, had flown probably days ago because word must have gone back that, you know, that something was happening in Pereira de Esh. There were forces coming. Just one phone call was enough to, to, to warn them. And we were sitting in this little uh, town called Nulila for three days, not moving. Either way, so we took over, we took over the town. That was just the two side force, okay? And then we were notified that there was a training base just 30, 40 kilometers north of, of, of the town called, uh, um, I forgot the name. Um, anyhow, we'll get there. And a Pew Pew, it was called Pew, P-I-E, Pew Pew. So we got quickly, we got another little force together. We drove, I also went, we drove up to this place called Pew Pew. We were... There was this MPLA training base. We shot the hell out of the place. Once again, the mortars, the armored cars. And then we went in to look and there wasn't a soul in sight. So it was just all for nothing. We drove back. We arrive in Rokana. And in front of our eyes, we see this convoy of hundreds of vehicles, of all sorts of trucks and, 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 and not army vehicles, of, of cattle trucks and, and vegetable lorries piled up with black troops, armed to the teeth, driven by white drivers. Apparently, we almost, I, I, as I arrived, I was far away, but apparently they saw us, they didn't know who we were. We saw them, we, we would, you know, South African, the South African Defense Force at the time did not have black troops, you know, so who the hell were these guys? And we all started shooting at one another. Um, um, anyhow, peace was made. And the, you know, the commandants and, and, and Colonel van Yerden, who was the colonel now in charge of the Zulu fort, um, uh, met up with commandants de Toy and, and uh, they introduced one another. And then um, the, um, I think the brigadier, um, the brigadier who now was based in Rundu, who was running this show, he flew in to give them orders for the next stage of the battle or of this, you know, of this, of this, uh, I don't know, I don't know what to call it, an onslaught into, into Angola. So apparently, apparently, the, the orders were given that we have to drive up towards the, the, the main city of, uh, uh, of southern Angola, which was called Sada Bandera. It's changed its name today. And we were to try and attack and take over and control Sada Bandera. Now, all along the way, these places were now, you know, uh, infiltrated by and run by the MPLA. Um, now, I want to get back to the ELP. So we've got these 50 mercenaries in about seven Jeeps with like uh, all sorts of bazookas and all sorts of weapons on them. And uh, they're not our age. They're not 18, 19 years old. These are guys in their 30s. They've been in the security services. They've been in special forces and that. We don't know who was backing them. We don't know who was paying them, but they were there. And they wanted to be part of this. And they had also come up for the ride. They'd actually come up on the western side of the Kunene River. When we attacked Rosades, we attacked from the eastern side. And there they were. We, I said a quick hello to them because they knew me from the days of Shitado. And then my sergeant major came over to me and said, listen, Laurie, uh, you trained these guys in the radio. They were useless because when this, uh, this SADF tried to contact them during the, the battle and before and to give them notification of what to do and where to go, but there was like radio silence. They didn't understand a word. So, so the, the head of Zulu 
decided that they need, uh, uh, you know, a South African radio person there. So they said to the sergeant major, sergeant major, you're going to be the liaison guy. So he said, I can't just be the liaison. I need a radio guy with me. So he said, Shokhat, come with me. <laughs> uh, I don't remember him giving me an option to go back because the rest of the, you know, the two side troops, they stayed there for, I don't know if it was a day or so, left some of them there maybe, and then they went back to the border. So that was like my opportunity to get out. I had no idea. I said, what the hell? So myself, Sergeant Major Berger, and these 50 crazy guys uh, crossed the Kunene River along this bridge, and we camped out on the western side just to guard the flanks. I didn't sleep a night. We, we stepped outside next to the, the, you know, our vehicles, and these guys were trigger happy. I mean, every little movement in the trees they shot at. So the whole night they were shooting. But fortunately, I woke up in the morning somehow, and we were still there. We were alive. I, I was sleeping with my gun in the hand, just ready for be, you know, to be attacked by the MPLA. But nothing happened. And then um, the next day arrived, and the convoy now that was going to go up north was uh, being prepared. So a decision was made that these L ELP guys were going to go along with Zulu. Zulu then uh, also decided they needed armored cars. So they took over all the armored cars from two sides to join. They also took over the mortar platoon uh, that was run by Staff Sergeant Bush. Um, so they took over our mortars, they took over uh, the armored cars, and they took over Sergeant Major Berger and myself. And we joined Zulu. And that was like the, the start, the official start for me of, of um, task force Zulu going up and, and taking over half of Angola. Um, so we went off from there and, and started making our, our way up, town after town. We drove 50, 60 kilometers a day. The armored cars were always just in front of us. Um, and um, I was, of course, also just receiving reports on the radio, but we weren't actively really involved. So we eventually arrived at the town. This is after, uh, I think, another two days and, and two or three other towns that we had uh, you know, conquered fairly easily with uh, no casualties whatsoever. And now the planning for the attack on Sada Bandera was going to take place. And, and I think this uh, discussion will then, uh, or this section of my story will end after the taking over of Sada Bandera, which I can talk for hours, just that alone. Anyhow, so we now had in, uh, in, in Task Force Zulu, we had, um, we had different subunits of companies, okay? The one company, uh, without going into the, the details, the one company was run uh, by, um, uh, or both were run by commandants. The one was Commandant Breitenbach, who he, he was in charge of the FNLA troops. And then there was also um, Commandant Lin, Linford, and he was in charge of the, Bus of the Bushman troops. And, and you should just be aware that, you know, the FNLA troops uh, didn't take a liking to the fact that we had painted UNITA on our vehicles, they because they hated UNITA. UNITA hated FNLA, FNLA, and we had to come to an understanding that, hey, we all together fighting a common enemy, which is the MPLA. So um, to attack Southern Bandera, and if you look at any maps, and I'm gonna ask, uh, I'm gonna ask Chris, I'm gonna ask you to put one or two photos and, and maps of, of, of it, you know, as I'm talking, Southern Bandera was a very modern, small city banking and infrastructure, and it had been there for hundreds of years. Very, it was very, very U European. The problem was, and it had its own airport, a proper airport this time. The problem was that Santa Bandera was surrounded by mountains to the south and a very high mountain on the eastern side with a statue of Christ, similar to that that you see in Rio de Janeiro. You see this big statue uh, up on the hill. And we received information from people who had refugees who had fled, that the MPLA had put uh, big guns up on the hill and, and, and we couldn't take the risk of trying to attack the city and being bombed from this hill or this mountain above, above the city. So a decision was taken to split the force. The one force with um, Commandant uh, Breitenbach, the FNLA guys and the armored cars, went along the road to the northern, northeastern part of the city about to take the airport, but they stayed back. The other, uh, the other force that was put together, we drove down through, the, through little villages and farmlands 
And we came in from a road from the south of Sadat Bandera. And I was with the ELP guys. The night before the attack, it rained. It rained so heavily. And we were just parking trucks along, along a road. And so, and we were trying to sleep, you know, you sleep outside. No, no tents, no buildings or anything. And it was raining so heavily that we all actually crept underneath the vehicle, me and, you know, the, the recce drivers and the guys who were in charge of these Bushman troops. And there we sat for a few hours under the vehicles and all the Bushmen just lying. That the rain didn't mean anything to them. They just slept through this pouring rain for hours. And we were supposed to now attack this hill, this mountain with the statue on top and the guns uh, at dawn. We were going to approach in the dark and attack at dawn. And who's the radio man? They need a radio man. There's a shock there again, unfortunately. So, uh, so some of the ELP guys and the Bushmen from, uh, you know, of Commandant Lin Linford, we started this trick, this walk of a couple of hours. Now we were up at three, four o'clock in the morning. So we walked for a couple of hours, started going up the hill. I looked to my left and I looked to my right. And then a Bushman aren't tall. I, I'm one meter 75, okay, five foot nine or whatever. These guys were all this height. And there I am, a head above them, and I've got the antenna sticking out. So I said to myself, if they have any forces there, I'm the first one to go. And there we are walking through the bush, uh, approaching the statue, and nothing happened, fortunately. Okay, there was, once again, they had fled. We didn't see any signs of guns. And so I was the guy who basically radioed the message back down to the forces at the bottom to say, there's nothing here, attack. You guys can attack. And then the attack actually took place of the airport. Um, uh, uh, Commandant Breitenbach and his, and his FNLA troops attacked. They, they, they killed tens of people. And, and even days afterwards, uh, if you drove out to the airport, you see the dead bodies lying around. But that was just the first part. There were three key elements to the taking over of Saga Bandera. The one was the yield with the statue and the guns on top. One was taking over the airport, and we see that actually in the Ukraine today as well. Airports are a very, very critical uh, uh, target for any, you know, a force wanting to take over a town. And the other third uh, item was the center of the town. How are you going to go into the center of this big city and take it over when none of our troops speak a word of Portuguese? Oh, we've got the ELP. Let them do the dirty work. And, and honestly, from, from what I understand, the, 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 the commandants and that they said to themselves, you know what, if somebody is going to get shot up and killed, let it be them and not our own troops. Okay, so there we were, we came back down the hill, went back to our vehicles, uh, and myself and just the seven jeeps of the ELP, and myself with the radio, drove into the city. We, we I don't know, rescued the city. As we drove in, we were surrounded by hundreds of, 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 of locals running at us and shouting, Viva, Unita, et cetera, and trying to hug us. And, and, and it was difficult. You couldn't hold on to your gun. And they were just surrounding us. And all of a sudden, somebody opened fire from wherever. So you got 50 ELP guys just shooting the hell out. I don't know where they were shooting at, but just shooting. And then everybody just went running away, et cetera. And we drove into the city. We didn't meet any other resistance. Um, I was giving feedback all the time and I had commandants screaming at me, give me a proper, explain where you are. So I don't know where the fuck I am. You know, I'm somewhere in the city. I don't know, we don't have any maps. And we eventually found ourselves in the center of the city. We arrived at the uh, police station, which was like really in the center. We notified them that, okay, uh, all was clear. And then other South African troops um, actually came in. There was also a military base called the Cartel, I think it was, where there was a fortune of armaments over there. So they drove into the city and now we had taken over the city. And now they had to plan what was the next move. First of all, where do we stay? Now, I was the only kind of South African troop, uh, other than my permanent force sergeant major, in the center of this big town with these ELP guys, okay? So where to stay somewhere? Uh, we discovered that behind the police station, and this being a very European city, there were two VIP uh, rooms with nice beds, hot water, and everything you could want. 
you know, for VIPs visiting from Luanda, et cetera. So Sergeant Major Berger and myself got one of the VIP rooms. In the other room, there were actually two young uh, ladies who actually had been connected to the MPLA and they were actually not just guests, they were prisoners in a way. I mean, there was no way for them to run, so there was no co contact with them. And the ELP guys then took over the, the control of the city. They organized the police to, to go around again. They took, took over the radio station, and that was very important for them to start, you know, just telling the citizens what was going on. And we actually spent a week there, almost a whole week, because during those days, um, the SADF decided they had to also capture a, a town uh, along, the, uh, along the coast that was more to the south called Mosamides, and they sent a task force out there to capture the town. So while they were out there capturing the town, I'm not going to cover that, but I'm going to cover what I did and what I saw. So they captured Mosamides and, the, and they came back. That took about three days, that whole endeavor, before a decision was made, what's the next stage, is, which was to now go towards Benguela and Ubito and, and get to the coast and take over the Benguela a railway line, for instance. Uh, and that was a, a key to, you know, to the next stage of, of you know, eventually getting to Luanda. So for five or six days, or almost a week, that we were in Sada Madeira. We, we drank every night. We went to a disco. We danced with some of the local troops, just me and my soldier major. And, and you know, and all the leaders, is, this, uh, Captain uh, Aporicio, who was the guy in charge of, of the ELP guys. We had some commandants coming from UNITA as well with their women folk to join us at night. And, and there was a singer. There was, I mean, this was war. And we going and sitting at a, at a disco, dancing and, and, and me drinking. That's where I learned to drink whiskey, first of all. I... I uh, also, we had to get around. So what did we drive in? So each of us, I had my own little Jeep, a little Suzuki, yellow Suzuki Jeep, and Sergeant Major Burger. We just took whatever vehicles we could find. And, and, and I would drive around the city on my own and, and have a good time. We went to eat a fantastic meal at, at the Grand Hotel. There was a hotel that was still working and serving meals. And, and they would never take money from us. We had some local money as well. So we had a good meal. I, we went to a movie. It was a movie house. It was working. Don't remember what the movie was. And they were so proud and happy to, to have us as, you know, as, as the victors and having got rid of the MPLA that they never, ever, nobody took money from us. They, they treated us like real, like unbelievably. And when we went to the movie house, for instance, the owner of the movie house took us to the screening room, showed us the equipment that he had, et cetera, et cetera. And, and other than that, we'd go around town. The one key thing I did of, of any maybe relevance later on in Sada Bandera is that when I walked into a shop and those shops were fairly empty, I mean, they didn't have a lot of goods left. I walked in a shop and I saw they had spools of Kodak. I didn't have a camera, but something said to me, Laurie, buy a spool or two. So I bought two spools or he gave them to me. I never took. And the rest will follow later where I got hold of the camera. But I did get hold of a camera. And those 12 photos that I have, that I've shared here and there, and I'm going to share it with you guys again, each photo is a testament to one different aspect of, of uh, Operation Savannah. And we'll see them later. So I took spools, not knowing what I'm going to ever do with them, but just in case. Another key element of... And, and, you know, I, I said, course, to you earlier on as well, that somehow, I don't know if it was God, or, but I, I was just at the, right time, at the right place at the right time, or at the wrong place at the wrong time. We were walking around. Oh, by the way, we, we changed clothing every day. Now, this, you know, the other great thing about Sada Bandera is that we could get out of these stinky green uniforms. Remember, we didn't wash for days on end. And was, we came across a huge amount of, of you know, Portuguese camouflage clubber and, and ponchos and hats and all, and weapons. So every day I was choosing which weapon I'd go around with, what you, uh, a uniform I would wear. I, I mean, it was crazy, but after two, three days, I realized that I'm, I'm playing with my life, not because of a possible attack by MPLA. I was walking around with two hand grenades stuck into my webbing yard. 
I know I'd never thrown a hand grenade. What would I do if one of them fell and, and exploded? So after two, three days, I put them to, to a side. Okay, I thought like I was like this Rambo going around there, but it was crazy. Um, eventually, um, we're walking around, and not on maneuvers, just in the town. And this uh, gentleman in a suit runs up to me, and he starts shouting in Portuguese. I'm saying, sorry, you know, just translate into English. And one of the ELP guys translated to me. He was the bank manager of one of the big banks there. And he had received notification from one of the banks in Lubitu that Cuban troops had arrived and they were on their way towards us. And this was, for us at least, I mean, I don't know if uh, back in Pretoria they knew about Cuban troops having arrived in Angola, but that was the first notification that I believe we ever received in, in Operation Savannah that there were Cubans that we were about to meet up with. So obviously, immediately I radioed that back, that went back to Rundu and Rundu probably to Pretoria, that we had confirmation from this bank manager that Cuban troops had arrived in, in Lubito, maybe also Benguela, and they were going to try and stop us. So after about five or six days um, of being there and really having a wonderful time, um, also we went out to visit the airports, et cetera. Uh, we woke up one day with our regular hangover in the morning. Um, we were told to report to the airport, okay? Not knowing what was going on, uh, Sergeant Major and myself drove off to the airport, where for the first time we were on the tarmac at the airport, and uh, uh, Colonel van Yerden and his second in command, uh, Commandant Kotze, were there. And Commandant Kotze came up to us and he said, okay, now Sergeant Major Berger, you have to stay back here because we're going to leave a force back in Sada Bandera to run it. So you will be the Sergeant Major kind of running the, the affairs that you're responsible for. And uh, I need a driver. He says to me, do you, do you know how to drive? I said, yeah. okay, so, and, and, this, uh, and you're a signaler, you're now going to be with me. And, and that's where fate, you know, just took me to the next stage in, in, in Operation Savannah. Because from Sada Bandera, the, the next day, uh, Zulu force was going to, you know, go off once again and make its way up towards, uh, towards the sea. Uh, to start attacking the, the, the big cities that were there that were key and strategic to the advance towards Luanda. And, and, and I think that's roughly where we can kind of almost end the story. I, I just want to say a, a quick kind of farewell. That was the last time that I saw Sergeant Major Berger. We, in fact, when we went to the airport, I, I didn't take my, my R1 rifle. I'd left it back at the police base. So I never, ever saw my R1 rifle again. When I got back to Wolfers Bay months later, they couldn't understand, like, where my original, you know, you got the rifle with this number, where the hell is it? I said, well, I don't know, it's gone. So I just had one or two other weapons that I obviously kept with me, and Sergeant Major Berger went off. What happened to him is, is that um, at a later stage, he also ended up in Sela, uh, and he was shot out him and a whole lot of other of our troops um, in, in a big battle uh, north of Sela. At a later stage, I'll, I'll, I'll get to there. I missed it, fortunately, because quite a few South African troops were killed there. And, and he became a bit bossy as, as a result. And for those who don't understand what bossy is, it's, it's, you know, he, he was um, it's a psychologically impacted, he, you know, he, he had a trauma as a result. And um, when he got back to uh, the border and the other troops from Tumsai who hadn't seen him or hadn't seen me now for a couple of weeks, they asked him, well, where's Shokhat? And, and he said, I don't know, we all just got shot up, blah, blah, blah. And that is actually from where I was assumed dead, missing in action. And, and we'll get to that as well at, at, at a later stage because I didn't know that I was supposed to be dead and missing in action. Um, Sergeant Major Berger, I never saw again, even when we went uh, back to our base. Uh, I don't know where he was at the time, but a year later, he was killed on the border uh, in a traffic accident. I don't know if it was related to a, a military event or whatever. Um, and unfortunately, that was the end of him because 40 years later, when I started looking up and trying to find all the people that I, I was with during the operation, um, 
you know, I eventually managed to get all the various names. Unfortunately, most of them are, are not around anymore. And, and this was the tragic loss of uh, Sergeant Major Berger, who as a result, who as a result of that uh, actual event, by the way, he received a, a, a commendation, he received a, a, an award, okay, and a, pro, uh, a medal, I, I don't know what it was, um, what it was, but um, that's just for the record. Okay, guys, so I think I, I'm going to leave you, an hour is enough. <coughs> We're about to leave Sada Madeira. Next stage of the story, we're going to make our way up. We're going to have our first battle with the Cubans, okay, on the way um, at, at what is called the Battle of Katang. That was the first time the South African troops uh, bumped into the Cubans. Then we took over Benguela. We, for the first time, were shot out by the, uh, the Red Eye missiles, which we didn't, hadn't been introduced to until then. We then took over... Uh, Dubito, um, the first South African troop died um, in Operation Savannah between Benguela and Dubito. We went up to Novo Redondo, the Cubans uh, blew all the bridges, and that basically stopped our advance, and, and we'll take that over in the next stage. Okay, of course. Well, I have to say to you, this is probably the best of honor the experience we've had to date, and I doubt if it can be better. It's a fantastic background which you gave us. I'm really grateful to you, Laurie. I have two or three questions, if you don't mind, quickly. Um, first, let me say that Commandant Kotze is not family of mine. Um, okay. That's good to know. In case people think it's a, a man. common name. It's a common name in South Africa. So, um, well, you know, if you were at school, there was this thing, Norpinar Kotze, and I'm not going to translate that, <laughs> we had many first fights about it. Which brings me to a, to a point. How were you treated as a Jewish boy in the army? Uh, were you treated well, or did you feel they were a bit of a thing against you? No, it, it wasn't. It was almost not relevant. Um, you know, in, 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 uh, in uh, Walfus Bay, I was one of about six or seven out of a thousand. I mean, which is kind of part of the... Dem dem uh, demography of South Africa, you know, you're a minority within a minority within a minority. And, and it didn't really matter that we didn't, um, only at, at, at a slightly later, later stage, we had a couple of Jew, uh, uh, like more religious uh, Jewish guys arrived at Roykop. They were now over 10. And once there were over 10 Jewish guys in a base, then you could actually pray together. If you don't have 10 people, you can't pray together. And, and some of them demanded or, or wanted kosher food. And, and listen to this, this is amazing. People would hardly believe that. 3,000 kilometers away, you've got a dozen Jewish guys who want their kosher food. Not all of us necessarily. I was prepared, you know, I wasn't a kosher religious guy. The South African Defense Force uh, took two of us and made them into chefs. They became chefs from being in an artillery or infantry unit into chefs. And once a week when this uh, plane load of whatever supplies and that was flown from Pretoria to Walfus Bay, they sent kosher food. And we sat separately, we sat separately, it wasn't always liked by, by some of the people that these, the Jewish guys are having special food, but it was accepted. And, and so, you know, that's a point that I think nobody could even like think about. Here you have this, um, um, army, military, defense force thing that even up in Savannah, they weren't sending us changes of clothing or underwear. They weren't, there were so many things logistically bad and in, in Operation Savannah that we were really, the troops were thrown in and not looked after at all. But back at, at that base, they looked after us. They took, you know, we didn't have... I think even once a Jewish army chaplain even came to visit, they flew him out and he came to sit and speak to us. So, so from that perspective, the SADF were totally, totally more than okay. All right. Well, I'm really glad to hear that because I, I had to argue with a few people about that, but we can argue with a man who was there. Now I need to ask you, these patches on your, on your jacket, ah, can you please have yeah. a good look at them? We've seen the yeah. taken... My leftover mementos. So over here we see anybody who was ever in, in Two Side, this is Two Side Battalion Group. 
the only actually infantry base that actually had infantry, artillery, and armor together. And that's why it was called a battalion group. And all three uh, units within that group were all up in Operation Savannah. And these were just two badges of uh, UNITA, uh, UNITA uh, on this one and the FNLA that somehow I managed to bring back because I'll get to that story, but I've kind of finished for the day. But when I got back to Rundu, I was sure that at some stage that, that I was going to be searched. So when I made my way from Rundu back to um, Walfus Bay, I just left everything there. Big mistake because I was never searched. I could have brought it all back with me. But that's another story as well. Okay. Yeah, well, most people were actually searched. I mean, and cameras was totally forbidden. And uh, so you were lucky to get those pictures, which we will put in here. Thanks for that. But now, last question. I know your son is a, is a paratrooper within the Israeli Defense Forces. You must be proud. You should be proud. And I believe you have his badge on as well on the on the other side of your jacket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't I'd show love you. to I, see I, that. You know, it's just very cold here now in winter. But the, this is, this is one of my son's coats. He's a paratrooper in the in the IDF, and this is just one of his coats. He's a sniper actually. Hasn't shot anybody, but but he's there uh, protecting our borders at the moment. And uh, I actually also did the army in, in in Israel at the age of thirty. I arrived in in 1982. And in 1987, at the age of 30, with a whole lot of other uh, foreign people, English, French speaking, Spanish speaking, about 50, 60 of us, uh, we went through four months of total Afkak, by the way. It was, it was tougher than it was in, 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 in Walfus Bay. If you want to hear about it, that's another story, but it was tougher. We didn't spend four hours a day marching. We didn't spend two hours a day fixing our beds. There was no time wastage. Nobody looked what you looked like. Okay, if there were creases or whatever, it was full on. And you were doing route marches with a guy on a on a stretcher for 20 kilometers and that type of thing at the age of 30. They don't give it that. I was married with a kid at home. Okay. Well, the two armies were always close together traditionally before the changes came in South yeah. Africa. The Israeli and the South Africa were always very, very close. They were, they were. And now I have to say to you, thank you. I know you're a busy man. To the rest of you listening here, don't worry, we will get Laurie back and we will carry on weekly. We will sit down and we'll tell the story further. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And let me say again to anybody listening here, you were not unimportant. Come and tell me your story. Don't let the story die with you. Don't let people tell you you were a GV or some horrible name. Don't let them do that. You went, you served, you wore a uniform, you're welcome with legacy. And until we meet again, to all of you, God bless. Bye. Keep up.